Who in this picture is the most suspicious? A, the couple strolling down the street, B, the old woman reading a book, or C, the creepy man on the bench in a trench coat reading a newspaper upside down staring directly at you. Trick question, it was actually the squirrel in the treetop who works for the CIA. Okay, let's try that again. Who's the most suspicious in this scene? Is it A, the man walking his dog, B, the man's dog, or C, the kids playing frisbee? If you guessed B, the dog, congratulations, you're wrong. This entire picture is actually a reflection in the CIA squirrel's eye. And is that flea in there for a bug or a bug? Whether they're darting underfoot or accessing restricted areas, animals rarely draw attention to themselves. Intelligence agencies have capitalized on this for centuries, not only to inspire the plots of cinematic epics like G-Force, but also using various critters for surveillance, concealment, covert communications, search and rescue operations, and to simply waste taxpayer dollars as quickly as possible. In April of 2019, some fishermen near Hammerfest, a town in northern Norway and not a festival devoted to hammers, discovered something some might call fishy, or perhaps whaley. A beluga whale came up to their boat. Not only was the beluga unusually friendly and docile, but the fishermen noticed that the whale was wearing a harness that looked like it was supposed to hold a video camera. Not only that, but the harness had written on it in Russian, property of St. Petersburg. So, either this whale was an attempt at a next-generation selfie stick that went rogue, or it was a Russian spy. After all, the Russian naval base at Murmansk is not so far away from Hammerfest. The Russian Navy, however, denied all involvement. But why would you admit to spying on someone? That's like the first rule of espionage. You don't tell people you're spying on them. The whale followed the boat back to Hammerfest Harbor and stuck around, begging residents for food and scratches around his blowhole. The residents soon named their favorite beluga whale Havaldemir, a portmanteau of the Norwegian word Haval, meaning whale, and Vladimir for Vladimir Putin, a man who, like Havaldemir, is known for being Russian and playing fetch. In addition to just playing fetch with balls, Havaldemir on several occasions would grab things from the harbor that people dropped in it. A woman's iPhone and a kayaker's GoPro. I'm hoping one day that I can go to Hammerfest and drop the sense of hope and wonder that I used to have as a child, so Havaldemir can bring it back to me. But Havaldemir is not the first animal who ever got a camera strapped onto them in order to commit espionage. There is a long lineage of spy cams being strapped to critters, and the first critters we stuck them onto were pigeons. In the early 1900s, a German man named Julius Neubrunner delivered emergency medications via carrier pigeon. One time, one of his pigeons arrived almost a month late, and he wanted to find out where exactly his pigeon had flown off to, or if his pigeon was cheating on him with another, more handsome pharmacist. Neubronner developed a tiny camera that could be strapped to a pigeon via harness, and he quickly realized that this invention could be great for reconnaissance during wartime. In the 1800s, several methods of air reconnaissance had been developed. For instance, strapping cameras onto balloons, kites, rockets, or simply strapping moon shoes onto them and hoping they bounced high enough to get a good angle. However, pigeons proved to be much more useful since their flight path could be determined by more than just the wind. Pigeons would be put in mobile dovecotes and released in such a way that their flight path back to their permanent nests would cross the place they're trying to take pictures of. Then, their secretive snaps would be developed once they got home. Pigeons were not only more covert than airplanes flying overhead, but the birds were also unperturbed by explosions that tend to happen during wartime, especially in the latrines. Balloons, on the other hand, as anyone who has ever played Balloon's tower defense knows, are more sensitive to explosions. Neubrunner's mobile dovecoats and camera-laden pigeons snapped pics during the Battle of Verdun and the Battle of the Somme. And between World War I and II, the Germans also added dogs to the equation. The dogs replaced the mobile dovecoats to transport the pigeons and instead carried them and released them in baskets. They were like Easter bunnies, except dogs, and instead of giving children eggs and chocolate, they gave the air pigeons. The toy company Elastalin produced this toy soldier with his spy pigeon and the basket dog, so you know they were being used during the war. But besides for taking pictures during the world wars, what else are our pigeons known for? That's right, poopin'. And yes, animal dung has been used for espionage too, because, well, all's fair in love and war, including doing stuff with poop. During the Vietnam War, Viet Cong soldiers would walk past seemingly innocuous piles of poop. They didn't pick them up and dispose of them at dedicated pet waste stations because the war-torn infrastructure of Vietnam at the time was stretched too thin to install pet waste stations in jungles. But had anyone picked them up, they would have found a big secret. The piles weren't actually poop but American communication devices used to direct airstrikes. Another thing people don't tend to pick up willy-nilly are dead rats. 
U.S. intelligence agencies decided to take the term dead drop literally. During the Cold War, dead rats would be stuffed full of information, money, messages, film, and other useful items like ammunition, fake identification papers, and Yu-Gi-Oh cards for American spies in Moscow and Berlin to use. Originally, the CIA would hide all of this stuff under rocks, but they soon learned something about the human condition. People just like to pick up rocks. So they switched to hiding their information to somewhere gross that nobody would ever touch. Corporations have been learning from this technique too. Many have issued advisories to their employees to advise against keeping their password-laden sticky notes on their desk. Instead, employees should keep these sticky notes under toilet lids. I use this technique too by keeping my social security card shoved firmly up my ear. Shoving things up ears is another method of creating covert critters though. In the 60s, some CIA agents decided to surgically implant tiny microphones up a cat's ear canal and a small radio transmitter at the base of its skull, connected by a discrete wire across its fur. This was seriously called the Acoustic Kitty. The idea was that this cat would walk around and transmit audio recordings of sensitive conversations undetected. There are a few problems with this. First of all, any conversation the cat would be close enough to transmit would just be something like this. Oh, it's a kitty. Look at the cute little kitty. Who's a handsome kitty? Etc. Etc. Second of all, cats are notorious notoriously independent and don't tend to go where CIA operatives might want them to go. For example, during the first field test of the Acoustic Kitty, instead of approaching the pair of men having a quiet conversation outside of the Soviet compound in Washington, D.C., the kitty ran into oncoming traffic and got hit and killed by a taxi cab. The CIA alleges that this never happened, but come on, it's the CIA. They also say that Santa doesn't deliver presents every Christmas. Anyway, some more tests were conducted, but the Acoustic Kitty project was canceled in 1967. After adjusting for inflation today, this project cost $150 million. But failure has never stopped the American government. This century, researchers with intelligence agencies have opted to insert microphones instead into moths. To do this, they would take moth pupae, cut them in half, and then insert a teeny tiny tube between the two halves that contains a mic and electronics. It's like an incredibly expensive hot dog that can spy on you, after it completes its development into a moth, of course. And this project inspired another failure. In the mid-2000s, DARPA was trying to create a robotic fly to be a, well, fly on the wall. However, battery capacity in the mid-2000s was not so great. Batteries small enough to fit on fly-sized bodies would only power the bot for a few seconds. But batteries with enough capacity to make the robot last long enough on missions made the fly about the size of a hamster, which is, well, not really covert. Based on experiments I've conducted, there's nothing that disrupts a meeting quite like a ginormous hamster-sized bug. However, there are some scenarios where giant robotic bugs are not a disturbance, but a welcome sign. Right. For instance, throwing them at jerks who are tailgating you is a fantastic use for them. But that isn't the use that researchers designing this robotic cockroach had in mind. This little guy is called Cram, or Compressible Robot with Articulated Mechanisms. He was designed after researchers studied the bodies of cockroaches to try and copy some of their bodies' incredible feats of contortion. There are two things that cockroach bodies are pretty good at. Squeezing through small spaces and handling compressive force. Researchers found that, when moving horizontally, Roaches could squeeze through spaces as small as three millimeters high. That's about the height of two stacked pennies. And when crawling vertically, a roach can squeeze up cracks about four millimeters wide. For reference, an average American cockroach is about seven millimeters tall, so they can fit into spaces about half of their size. Not only can roaches squish into tiny spaces, but they can also withstand being squished. Researchers exerted forces on various roaches and found the bugs could withstand a constant compressive force of 300 times their body weight. This would be like if the pilgrims put four elephants on top of Gaius Cory, and he still asked for more weight. Roaches can even withstand this compression while moving through the narrowest crevice. And if that wasn't impressive enough, it turns out that roaches can also withstand a one-time force of 900 times their body weight. That would be like if a mobster whacked someone with a sock filled with half a million frozen sticks of butter. So, pretty much, this is why a roach will be just fine after you stomp on one. After studying this, researchers created a roach-like, compressible robot. Its shell
shell is made of polyester and plyboard, and took inspiration from origami to make its shell compressible. They conducted similar tests on their bot as they did to real roaches and determined that cram could, indeed, be crammed into tight places. The researcher said this bug bot could be used for search and rescue, but you know it's only a matter of time before the CIA decides to stick a microphone on or in it. Honestly, if a giant bug robot crawled over me while I was trapped in a building, I would be pretty horrified. But I think this next robot might freak people out as much, if not even more. It's a search and rescue snake bot. Dr. Gavin Miller designed several different snake bot prototypes, taking inspiration from a Japanese researcher. The earliest prototypes had wheels and moved around via undulation, pretty much squirming around and slithering like you see snakes often do, or like a horizontal version of the classic and sensual dance, the worm. However, the final prototype instead employs what's called rectilinear locomotion. This sort of movement is most often used by heavy snakes. For example, this python Dr. Miller encountered on his honeymoon in Bali, which he said inspired these later prototypes. Rectilinear motion is one of the most unique ways that snakes move. Sections of a snake's belly sort of step forward. The muscles lift part of the belly up from the ground and put it forward of its previous position. Then, the belly pulls the rest of the snake forward. This sort of movement is slow, but quiet, so it's often used by snakes as they stalk their prey. And that means it's perfect for robots stalking people they're spying on, too. Other than spying, snake bots are also advantageous for search and rescue and for reconnaissance. They can traverse rough or muddy terrain that is prohibitively complex for wheeled robots or someone in 8-inch stiletto heels to traverse. Also, the repetitive motor elements make the entire snake bot less susceptible to mechanical failure. And finally, they're just really cute. I mean, look at this little guy. Snake bots haven't made it out to the field for search and rescue missions yet, but one did serve a very important mission. It was the ring bearer at Dr. and Mrs. Miller's wedding. There are so many creative ways that we have used or taken inspiration from critters for use in spy missions, and also so many stupid ways. Thanks for watching BioArk. Comment down below with your favorite character from G-Force.